I will let you know here at the beginning that um, at the end of the lesson, I'm going to just, uh, when it's time, I will pray and end it. But I'm going to be up here for any that might want some prayer or some ministry while everyone is released. You know, I've just discovered that we are such quiet fellowshippers that uh, you can do ministry at the same time the fellowship is happening because people really aren't loud when we're fellowshipping. We're just visiting and enjoying each other. But um, for the time being, we're not going to be doing the questions and answers. We're going to be instead spending it in, in ministry and in fellowship. So um, you can think about that. And one of, one of the things I firmly believe, I believe that as the word is ministered, there's healing in it. The reason I believe that is because the Lord <coughs> sent forth his word and healed them. Now, I didn't look that up, but I know it's in there. He sent forth his word and healed them. Therefore, in the word itself is healing, as we allow the breathing of the word to happen in us. And so, I have not had the joy of being in front of you since June, I believe, or the last first part of July, as we had Pastor Charity and then we had Lauren. And so you will get me this time and next time, and then the last time in September, you will, we will have Carol Ball with us. So you'll want to bring all your friends to hear that lady. I think that's the 21st of uh, September when, when that occurs. And I'm looking forward to it. Um, those of you who would like to pray for them, um, Chris Ball, who is the president of Elam, and he had some stents put in yesterday in his heart, and he's doing very well. He's home and resting, and he had had one done, but it, the others weren't clearing, so they went in and put, I think, three in. So uh, he's resting and doing well. Just remember him in prayer, because that's, uh, when you start working with heart, you got, when you have heart trouble and start working with heart, it's serious every time. It's not uh, light or anything, so you can hold him in prayer with that. Well, as you see on your bulletin, the title of the message is Warfare in the Spirit. Last time I spoke here, we worked with the first 11 verses of Philippians 1. And in doing that, and I should just briefly review them, I think you have them there. I won't be working with the first part. We will start in verse 12 tonight. But in working with a brief review, we worked with the fact that Philippians is a love letter. It's a thank you letter from Paul to the people at Philippi. Uh, it was written when he was at house arrest in Rome, his first imprisonment. And uh, people are always talking about how he was in an awful Roman prison when he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, and so forth, and he wasn't. He wrote these books in his first imprisonment. He was in house arrest. He evidently was released and went and did some more missionary journeys. And, and the second wave of Nero's persecution, he was uh, imprisoned once again, and this time he was in prison. But we do not have any biblical record of that period of time, and if he wrote books, we don't have them. So these particular books, he was in a house arrest, prison for sure, but uh, limited. Uh, it would be like us having one of those things around our leg, couldn't go, but so what? he had to have a Roman soldier with him everywhere he went. So um, he was just expressing his love for them, that they're sharing his work, and they, he appreciates their contributions because they, they, they contributed to him from the beginning. We'll see that in the fourth chapter. Um, um, he wanted their love for one another to then empower the full knowledge and so forth. And we, we um, find that, it, he said, you just, this verse 9 says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in, and that word knowledge is epi-knowledge, full experiential knowledge, and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I love those passages and I love passages like that, but what he's began to show me is the that and so that's. For instance, 
if they don't abound more and more and more in love for one another, they cannot have the full experiential knowledge of God. It's bound with a wrapping of love. And that's just not accidental. That's a purposeful belonging. All right? And then it, the depth of insight. People wanting to know more. The depth of insight. Sometimes our shallowness of involvement with other people's lives are the reasons why we are not able to work with a full knowledge of God and of the things and his purposes and deeper things. And this one kind of, you know, they, you find it not just here, you find it in Colossians 2, you find it all the way through the thing. But he's, when he prays for them, it's always a progression. And then there's many things that are ours in Jesus that many Christians, whoops, excuse me, many, there it is, <laughs> the wire. Many Christians do not, they might want them, because they can't imagine a true Christian not wanting everything that God is to be used in their lives, right? But they may be indeed his children, but not willing to invest themselves in a way, not just in him, but in others, so that their hearts can be open to receive what he has for them. It's an all working together. It's, it's not, no man is an island and no man stands to themselves. No one, no one gets the riches of Christ all by themselves. We have to have each other. And, uh, you know, I, I, of all people, can testify to this. I guess in my life, I've had periods where I have purposefully isolated and sometimes that's been out of pain and sometimes that's been out of just necessity of time. But it does not work for what I want in my life. What, what works in my life is allowing other people to love me and being loved in return, which is risking. It's risking. It risks life. It risks uh, belonging to people. It just risks. And uh, some of us have done that and kind of wanted to go on and leave it behind. And God came so long and says, no, I don't think so. In order to answer your prayers, I've got to put you in the middle of people that are going to love you and disarm you yeah. with that love. Yeah. And he just works that way. But that was then. We, were, we worked with that a little bit differently, but we worked with that nonetheless. All right. <clears throat> and in verse 12, we're going to begin to work with what I call warfare in the, of the spirit or in the spirit. You're used to hearing me teach, so you're used to me using the spheres. All right? Let me just get to my passage so I'll have my passage open. Uh, Philippians 1. Huh? Oh, thank you. She has the same Bible I do. I thought I had that marked, but I didn't. There we are. You're right. All right. In Jesus, we see this very clearly in Ephesians 1, in 1, 3, where he says we've been blessed in the heavenlies with all spiritual blessings. And then he begins to enumerate about 14 different items that are spiritual blessings. And we have an idea, uh, we're blessed in the spiritual realm or in the heavenly places. This is the earth, it's where the blood was spilled. And we often think of these heavenly places as somewhere above us as we often envision God somewhere above us. But what we have to begin in the New Covenant to understand is that the Holy Spirit came to live inside, and you would say? Amen. All right. Um, and therefore, the throne of God is where? <laughs> These are concentric circles. He's not only the God of everything outside of you, He's the God of everything inside of you. That gets scary. But that's the truth of the New Covenant. And dealing with both spheres while we live in one, but learning to live in the other, is the journey of our Christian walk in the Spirit. The Spirit realm is right here with us. The, they're concentric. It's concentric with us. We can't see it because we're looking in the natural. It doesn't, 
exist here in the natural, it exists here in the spirit. And we are learning to see with spirit. We're learning to hear with spirit. We're learning to do everything according to spirit. And as a result of that, our warfare is different. Um, I've been a long time in the charismatic slash Pentecostal movement in Syracuse, New York, ever since the 70s, late 70s, 77, and particularly got very involved in 78. And so I learned a lot of the warfare tactics that were taught then. I even taught them. Um, and as time goes by, what you find God doing is he gradually takes his word and begins to unfold it in such a way that it tells us things differently than we understood them uh, three years ago, yep. two years ago, certainly 20 years ago. So when he unfolds the truth, then we have to adjust to that truth. And so learning to do warfare while I'm being, while I'm in the spirit is very different. It's not just loudly speaking in tongues and doing some things that we used to do. To be truthful, that doesn't do much in the spirit, but it does make the flesh feel pretty good. <laughs> feel like you've done something. But that's not spirit. Now, go with me here for a moment. We're going to come to some, we're going to work with the rest of this chapter in a few moments. But I, I want you with me to understand what we're working with. The characteristics of spirit dimension access, the characteristics of what it is when it's working in the Holy Spirit. Because you see, you're in a body and the spirit is in the body. And therefore, if it's Holy Spirit working, uh, your, he will work with your body if he's you. You understand what I'm saying? He can't work when Pam spoke from his heart during the worship. He couldn't speak that word if somebody didn't speak it. I can remember a Sunday school teacher I had as a young adult when Joe and I were in a uh, Christian uh, college, it's now a university, and the Sunday school that was on campus and a, a very outstanding man who actually wrote the book we studied in the book of Hebrews was my Sunday school teacher and he was he, he would begin his class, and I, I loved it because it was, it was a, he, he firmly meant it. He said, I wish Jesus, you could just see Jesus standing here because I want you to hear him. And that, that was wonderful, and for its time it served well. But the more I thought about that, I thought, you know, if Jesus had just wanted to show up himself, he wouldn't have sent me, and he wouldn't have sent you. You are the image that Jesus wants to use now. And he's not going to just, now he may speak it to a person as they're in the word or talking to him or working with him, but he's not necessarily going to speak a word to the body. Booming voice, everybody can hear. <laughs> he's going to use somebody, they'll open their mouth and talk. All right, you got it? So walking in the spirit while we're in the body is what walking in Jesus is all about. But when we go to warfare, I, I just, there's some, there's some characteristics I've learned. So if you'll bear with me, and I think you'll find these, I didn't put any scripture to these. These are just what I've observed and what I've seen as I'm walking. I'm involved. That's why I said Pam. She was involved in getting the word to us. I'm involved. You're involved. He involves a human being. Faith is a confidence of being in that spirit. All right? And I'm going to give you some passages in a minute that will solidify that even more. The third thing down, it's not a natural way. For instance, now you could shout at it, but shouting doesn't make it spiritual. Battling doesn't make it spiritual. Fighting doesn't make it spiritual. Being fearful and praying against. By the way, do you realize we don't have any biblical examples of praying against anything? Not at all. Fighting it. Fighting in the, there, there's, let me tell you why. It all has to do with perspective. And you're in one of two places. It's either done or you're doing it. And if it's done, you're not fighting. You're moving from its end point in victory 
taking dominion in it. You know the song we sing? It's a very good song. He's under my feet. He's under my feet. And then we go into warfare and battle him. No, 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 no. He's under my feet. Dust. You understand? It's done. So we're not fighting and we're not battling. We're working with truth and we're working with the Spirit of God in holiness and in righteousness and according to the Word. Now then, that Spirit, if it's done, you have faith. By the way, do you know every Christian has enough faith? Hang on. I know we grow our faith and so forth. But in Romans, we're told that he gives everyone measure of faith. It's not a measure, and it's not the measure. It's measure of faith. In other words, everybody gets a measure of faith. It's like when a baby is born, they have the same amount of muscles. If they're a normal child, they have the same amount of muscles of a person of that sex, no matter what. Right? Now it's up to feeding it, exercising it, building it growing it but you're given when you got born again you were given the faith you need to live people pray oh give me more faith he can't it's a part of your body as a spirit person now use it <laughs> use it develop it that's what he's after all right so we're we're operating from the faith not the fear The done has a rest, confidence, and assurance. And the have to do it is a push, fear, and a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. Now, when the spirit is flowing through you, it will wear your body out. He will wear your, it, when he burns, anointing burns through, and he wears you out. But it's a different kind of exhaustion than if you had, had run a mile. Altogether different kind of exhaustion. So. In, in following the anointing and following the fire that we, we ask the Lord to place within us, it is a rest and a confidence, much like the three, three that went into uh, the fiery furnace during Daniel's time. All right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they walked in the fire and nothing got burned, no hair got singed. Even the guards that threw them in died from the fire, but they did not. And it seemed as one was walking among them like the form of the fourth. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. No effort. Now, but I say no effort. There's always effort in the spirit. Always effort in the spirit. But it's different. Thought processes. The word and supernaturals. Not if or maybe. But statements and, and de declarations that are according to our sonship, acceptance, and victory. Now, in 2 Corinthians, um, there was one I wanted, that's in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17, this is what it reads. But he that is joined into the Lord is one spirit. Most of your translations will say, one spirit with him. In other words, there's not two spirits in you, yours and his. There's one. It's his. Whoa. All right. So, as we work in thought processes, 2 Corinthians 10.5 most of you know this in our warfare passages casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ in the middle of the night wide awake been sleeping very well it's about four o'clock And everything that could cause me pain and worry, emotional pain and worry, began to flood. Ever have it happened? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Lots. Just remember, the enemy cannot read your thoughts. 
If you didn't know that, he cannot. All he can do is feed you, walk across your door. He can all, only aim them at you. You determine who you invite in to dinner. When we choose, and one method I have found that really works with me is that I say, all right, Jesus, I am supposed to be thinking about things in heaven. Your word says so. So let's go there and let me see to think about. And the next thing I know, it's morning. But I do that often. Almost every night, the battle gets severe. I've got four kids. They're all in their 50s. Well, they will be this fall. David gets to turn 50 this fall in November. And I have no knowledge whatsoever what they're doing or what they need. One good way to run a mama crazy. Okay, Jesus, they're yours. Gave them to you a long time ago. I'm not picking them back up. Now, let's think about something in heaven. You see... Our thought processes will depend if we're not acting out of natural or we're acting out of spirit. And this passage that we're going into, the reason I gave this little introduction is because the passage we're going into, Paul is sharing very openly his embattled thoughts about circumstances of people opposing him. He has himself opposing himself. You ever feel like that? Oh, yeah. He has the church opposing him. And he has unbelievers opposing him. And as I looked at it, I thought, you know, this is a real, this is a real teaching that Paul did for these people in sharing his thought patterns of how to walk in those three things, which are the main oppositions we run into. You know, ourselves... Uh, our family either in church or natural and then unbelievers and how to think about them what to do with ourselves in the middle of them I do not respond well to conflict uh, Pastor Charity on the other hand lived, lives for it she can handle it in the coolest way or not I've seen her do both but I love the fact that she has a very fine mind that thinks through it. I get shortcut in my brain with the emotions of somebody coming after me. You understand what I'm saying? In conflict, I really have to settle my brain. So if you're like me, and not real good when I get in conflict, I need to get out and I need to think and I need to cool myself down. But he gives a way to work those things in spirit and when we don't wait till the conflict happens but we're beginning to work in the spirit this way anyway then when the conflict does happen we have a way to go Bob Mumford used to use a term he said um, we need to and he was working with with terminology uh, primarily of his day thinking of going to the Father's throne. We know we're in the Father's throne, but let's still use that terminology a minute. He said, we need to run until we have a deep rut. You know what a rut is? I lived in Texas and Oklahoma, and mud ruts are big things. They're, they're big, deep ruts. they just ruts in the road. When you get in a rut, you can't get out of the rut. You got to go that direction because your car's not going to go the other. You got to go the direction. He says, get a big deep rut gone from you to the Father so that when something happens, you just lay down in that rut and roll. Well, that's what we're working with here is just training our minds in that rut with the Lord. This is the way my mind's going to roll, Lord. I am convinced that if we choose to believe the word and order our thoughts according to it our thoughts and the difficulties of our minds can be healed and uh, that's huge but if we're learning to think according to the spirit and send our mind places 
then what happens is our mind begins to go according to spirit instead of reason. All right, now then, let's look at what it says in chapter 1, verse 12, and you have the scriptures there. You may want to look in your Bibles as well. All right. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, whoops, excuse me, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Now I want you to notice a few things. This is the first one he's going to discuss. He is Paul the Apostle who's been on three, four missionary journeys and now he's not traveling anywhere. Talk about an emotional... He's not out about the churches. He's, not, he's, he's talking to the Jews. Anybody will come to him. He's still preaching and teaching. He's writing. He wrote some very good books during this time. But you understand what I'm saying. He's used to being a world traveler. He is a very fine scholar. A Jewish scholar and lawyer. And by the way he defended himself in Acts, the conclusion by lawyers is he was also a Roman lawyer. He's a very wealthy young man in his natural inheritance because he was sent to Jerusalem to study under the best of law and you didn't do that if your parents couldn't pay for it and of course he lost all of that this is not a man that doesn't matter to anybody this is not a man that that has had uh, uh, hasn't had the best and the worst and he's in house arrest. And he says, notice what the man says. It's not his fault, by the way. We'll work with that in a minute. He says, I want you to know that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Ah, uh, you mean you're not out there preaching? You're not out there doing anything? But you're telling me that this, even though this has meant you being in a Roman house arrest prison, that you say this is advancing the gospel? Now notice, his heart was not his personal comfort. And he wasn't getting confused with his purpose and his function. His purpose was to do what God wanted him to do every minute of every hour regardless of his circumstances. His function was a traveling minister and apostle. But he's not confusing the two because he's looking at it now and he's saying, wow, this is actually working to do what I was working so hard to do. The gospel is advancing. Now notice, notice how it does. He says, throughout the whole palace guard and everyone else, that I am in chains for Christ. I beg your pardon. Those Jews falsely accused him of violating the temple. He did not violate the temple, but they accused him of that. And the Romans kept him safe, and if they had let them go, the Jews would have killed him. And they didn't want that happening, because that would have been problematic. So he ended up going to Caesar, going to Rome, because he appealed to Caesar to stay alive because of the Jews. At no time had he done what he was accused of doing, and yet he doesn't blame. Please see. He's not, he will say at one point this happened, this is the way it happened, but he doesn't blame the Jews. He's not asking for a write-in campaign to Nero. He's not blaming Rome. He's not blaming the Jews. He's like Jesus. Jesus says, no man takes my life. I what? I lay it down. Who's responsible for the death of Jesus? Jesus and the Father not the Romans, not the Jews. Oh, Jesus. You see, in spirit, it looks different. Here, it looks like the Jews did it. Well, in the natural, the Jews did it, didn't they? 
But in the spirit, who was working behind the scenes? God was. Now, God didn't lock him up. The Jews and the, and the Romans did. God didn't make them do that. That wasn't in God's plan. God's going to use whatever plan man gives him. For the furtherance of the gospel. We have swallowed some theology. Swallowed. <laughs> swallowed some <coughs> theology that's not biblical in the way we blame God for everything. No, he didn't cause him to be locked up. Like he didn't cause the bad things in, in my life or in your life. He's going to work with us in spirit on two dimensions at the same time. Let me tell you this. Where does God live now? Tell me. Inside. Does he hear your prayers? He has no choice. He lives in you. Of course he hears your prayers. Every one of them. And what does he promise to do? Yeah. Do them. And we keep looking here. And he says, we're working up here and we, we're, we're working in this dimension. It's in the same placement. You just can't see it, but I've always answered everything you've ever asked for. But this happened and that happened. Uh-huh, here, not here. They locked Paul up. It seems very unjust. He says, God's working a miracle. Now, if we can learn in spirit to say God's working a miracle, God's working a miracle. God's working a miracle. <laughs> All right, this, this won't let me go, so I'll, I'll share it with you. Our crowds have been low. This is a good crowd. So every, every crowd's a good crowd. But the crowds have been lower than they've been in the last 10 years. And the last three years... They've, they've struggled somewhat. We've had lower crowds. And uh, I keep waiting for the Lord. Tell me what to do. Can I do anything else? Is there anything else I can do? Now I'm thinking. Is there anything else I can do? And he's working. He reminded me of something today. Back in the 90s, before we ever landed at the little church that's up there on the hill, or at St. Andrews, or here. Back in the 90s, early 90s, mid 90s, we were, well it was, it was, no it was, it, it was the late 80s, early 90s. We were using the Church of the Resurrection building one Friday night and then two weeks later we used the Christ the King United Methodist Church out in Liverpool for one of them. And our crowds would vary and we got way, one time there was only maybe one or two other people other than our, our team. And uh, one of my people on my team got really upset with that. And uh, I said, well, we're just going to wait and see what God does. Well, God turned it around and our crowd started building. And we ended up with 30 to 50 people most times, sometimes larger, sometimes less. He reminded me of that. Because you see, in a ministry, as in church attendance or as anything else that you're working with, things go in seasons a bit. What the problem we have sometimes is when they're really big and like this, or we think they're big, we slough off the work that needs to be done here because we've got so much work to do here. But regardless, what happens is God is always working here. And some nights when our crowd have been small, as we have left, Lauren and I have said, well, that was a small crowd, but wow, the work in the spirit that was done and could not have been done with a larger group. Yep. So <clears throat> I don't count anymore. <laughs> I don't count, because it doesn't matter. What does matter is, I mean, the Lord is the provider. The Lord is the one in charge, and he will let me know if I need to change something, which he does off and on. 
But we need to understand that this dimension has to be our primary focus if we intend for this dimension to glorify the king. And so Paul is giving us a real way here. Look at things differently. Look at things here. Miracle after miracle of provision for Psalm 19. Things you just wouldn't believe happen, happen. Unbelievable love poured out. Favor poured out. Unbelievable stuff. If we're just looking here, we might not see what's happening here. And I want to say that to your life and to mine. We've got to lift up our eyes and we've got to stop being so myopic and narcissistic. Because you see, <laughs> we have a tendency to evaluate this mighty God of ours by what we see happening in the natural. And if we had done that when he died on the cross, we would be like Peter, let's go fishing. But in the spirit, he had just brought the world back to the Father. Do you, under, you see the difference? So in our lives, let's reach for the way to think in spirit. Lord, show me a little what you're doing. This may not be comfortable for me. This may be awful for me. But what are you doing, not only in me, what are you doing with me? And what are you doing with others while this is going on? We have to train ourselves to lift us into the spirit realm. We have to train ourselves. First one is, he says, this is, don't blame others. Don't look at others and say, this is their fault. No, it isn't. Even if, even if they did, let the blame go. And receive it as something God's going to use. Verse 14, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Oh, wow. How can locking someone up give somebody where they're not in fear? I don't know, but it works that way. You know, I'm going to tell you something. Christians are like cockroaches. I, I grew up in the South where there are lots of cockroaches. You know, you get rid of them and they come back again. You squish one, you know you got a million others. All right. You can't, every time a Christian is locked up, the whole body of Christ increases. Believe it or not, we think it's awful. Yes, it is. The martyrs seeing people get their heads cut off. That hurts my heart. But I know what God is doing in the spirit. I know the Muslims are coming to Christ by the millions. They really are. They're coming to Christ by the millions. Why? Because these people have something to die for that's life, not just death. It's a stark contrast between the promises they promised their young people that they'll blow themselves up to those who will voluntarily take the death to themselves and increase the, the way of God. All right. Verse 15. The second one. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. Uh, that could be jealousy and competition. <laughs> But others out of goodwill. The latter, the ones out of jealousy and competition or envy and rivalry, do so, uh, I mean the latter, those of goodwill, do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition or self-interest, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. Please notice the next passage. But what does it matter? King James says, what then? <laughs> the important thing is in every way, whether from false motives are true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. <laughs> I don't have to agree with them to love them. I don't have to agree with them to watch God move and bless them. Oh, his attitude in spirit is magnificent. I'm going to bless Christians. <laughs> Had something happen just a few weeks ago. 
I need, it's one of those things you will never get out of me what it was. <laughs> but something happened and it really hurt my heart. It just hurt my heart. And I said, Lord, and before I could even complain about it, which complaint was right here. He said, don't take an offense. I'm working on it. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't take offense and I didn't have to work it out. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Because when somebody comes and just kind of slaps you in the face, the next thing you know, you want to slap them back. Spiritual people don't. So I had to take myself in hand and put myself under the teaching of Jesus to teach me spirit here because it wasn't right. And you know, when something happens that's not right, I like to get it right. He said, don't take offense, I'm working on it. So, I'm praying for those people in ways I've never prayed for people before, like that. And I'm very mindful of those prayers. Because, was it intentional? Oh yeah. Was it intended to hurt me? I wasn't a factor in that. In other words, that wasn't thought about at all. The move was intentional. I wasn't thought about as a person in it at all. It was done out of another source. But you need to know that when things oppose you, you have a choice, particularly in the body of Christ. You have a choice. Do I get angry with them? This isn't something I can straighten. This isn't something that my talking to them would have any effect on it. And I know that. In cases where it has, I've waved a flag. This one, no. But the Lord is moving in ways I don't know. And he's using them in ways I don't know. So instead of getting all huffy, pray for them. Pray for the work of their hands. Pray for the kingdom that is under them. Pray for the things that they need. Pray for... You understand what I'm saying? Pray for them. Because what does it matter if Christ is preached? Hallelujah. What does it matter? And we need deeply to have that in our systems. All right. <laughs> what does it matter? It doesn't matter as long as Jesus is preached. Well, they don't really have right doctrine. Well, probably you don't either. Oh, you were quiet with that one. Do you, do you know it's not our right doctrine that makes us satisfactory before God? You're not talking with me very much. Now, I, I love to be right according to the word of God, but that does not make me right with God. What makes us right with God, people? Loving Jesus. Loving Jesus, being in a relationship with Jesus. That's where I'm made right with God. And the more I study the word, the more I know most of our doctrines are slightly... Mm. But guess what? They probably always will be because we're fallible. Mm -hmm. That's not where the grace lies. The grace lies in the love and the relationship. So you love those who love Jesus, whether they sing the same songs you do or not. Whether they praise the Lord like you do or not. He gives us choices in all of this but beloved he says what does it matter as long as Jesus is preached and God is and Christ is being glorified all right verse 3 well <coughs> he says yes and I will continue I rejoice and I will continue verse 19 number three for I know that through your prayers and God's supply of the whole of the Holy Spirit of the Spirit of Jesus Christ what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. That word is sotera, which means salvation, prosperity, everything good in God. He said, this is going to turn out for my good in every dimension. I eagerly expect and hope 
that I will in no ways be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted or magnified, some say, in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ. And to live in Christ means warfare continues. I'm going to continue. This means Christ to me. It means learning the spirit ways over the flesh ways, Christ. Redemption for all people, love for all people, inclusion for all who will come. You understand what I'm saying? Christ in me. And to die is gain. <laughs> Woo! Home free. This is his interior battle. If I am to go on living in the body or the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I, I don't know. I'm torn between the two. This is his internal fight. I desire to depart and be with the Christ, which is better by far. In other words, I'm tired of this business. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the flesh. Convinced of this, I know that, what, that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Now, I want to compare that with his, what he said to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 8, he said this, 4, 6 through 8. He said to Timothy, same man, for I'm now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. He knew his time was done. He wasn't expecting their prayers with the supply of the Holy Spirit to deliver him at all. He was expected to go home. But here he is expecting to be delivered back to them. Verse 26. So that by my being set through my being with you again your boasting in Christ will abound on account of me now for the fourth one the last one and one of them that's a, probably a little difficult for us and I, I would say that some of the one the internal one was he discerned God's will for himself and knew he would be staying around later in Timothy he knew he was almost done all right, number four. Whatever conducts, verse 27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm. In, and this says, in the one spirit, literally in one spirit. Now I already gave you that reference. Striving together as one. If you look at King James um, it says, um, oh, I guess it's elsewhere, isn't it? Yeah, striving together with, yeah, with one spirit and it says one mind. The word mind in the King James happens to be a word we used for, for psychic or psychology. It means soul or being, so it's not specifically the one for a mind. Um, the text for the NIV does not have it there. The text, the Greek text they were using. To stand firm in one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Has someone ever kind of come at you and opposed you and got after you and made you fearful? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And he's saying intimidation is what the enemy works best. When someone's trying to make you feel little and intimidate you, please know that's your enemy, the devil, trying to make you feel low. Because then you can't feel like a victor, right? right. But in the spirit, we know we already have the victory, right? right. So he says, you stand firm in one spirit with Jesus and with each other 
striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. You know what I have found out about people who treat you that way and, and put you down and bully? They're wimps. Most of the time, if you stand up to them without being, you don't have to get ugly back at them. But if you stand firm and said, not now, and probably not later, I don't respond to that. I had to stop one in my life like that. It took everything I had, but it stopped. And that person has never, ever done it again. So we have to stand, it's called getting strong in the spirit, stand against those who would intimidate and put down and make life difficult. That's difficult, I know it is, but it says, and I'm, I think in, in his thing here, I, I was thinking about the times he stood in a courtroom with people telling the judge things about him, and it's recorded in Acts, that could get him killed. It could get him killed. Rome, if he was guilty, Rome would have to execute him. And he wasn't afraid. He put his feet down and he defended himself. He, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Now, that's a big step. But in the spirit, we are all able to do that. We're able to love them and stop it. <coughs> We're able to love them and not be fearful. I can't do that in my flesh. I'll just be flat out with you. In my flesh, it's going to scare me spitless. But in my spirit, I know that I have this access to this in God that I can stand and I can say no. I'm not frightened by you. Notice what it says. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed. Whoa. But you will be saved and that by God. Now I want to work with the word sign because it's very important to know what the word sign means. When Jesus was born the shepherds were given a sign. What was it? Not a star. The baby would be in a manger and wrapped in swaddling clothes. The star was given in the east to the Magi. And they didn't follow it, by the way. Had they, gone, had they followed it, they would never have gone to Jerusalem. They saw it. They knew it announced the king. They headed to, the, to, to Jerusalem, which was the capital. And when they found out it was Bethlehem, then the star arose again over where the young child was. And by then, the ch it was a child, not a baby. No wise men in the manger scene. Sorry about that. You good Anglicans, you know that. You study, you, you celebrate Epiphany. Now, a sign is just that. It's a sign. There's a sign out here by Lindbergh when you go to South Salina. It says what? Stop. It says it's Lindbergh. And then it says stop. Well, what does that mean? It's a sign. It's to show you that there's danger. You're not supposed to go out there. You could go over here and that one does the same and all the way through. It's a sign. A sign is something that's given to you that is an indicator. That's all it is. It's a sign. All right. When you're not afraid when they oppose you, that is an indication that they're in danger. And that you're not. I don't quite know how that works, but in the spirit it does. All right. Verse 29, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, suffer in the flesh, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Knowing these things, knowing all these things about spirit and 
flesh and how to work and learning to work is, is our trial and error, literally, as we're learning through the Word and we're seeing it in the Word and we're getting it. We're learning to do it. But these are four things that Paul just literally opened his heart to these Philippians and said, these are the things I'm struggling with. And this is how I've learned to think about them. What a gift. What a gift. That whatever, 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 I can say, this has happened. As bad as it might be, this has happened for the propagation of the gospel. The gospel is advancing because of this. Praise be to God. I know, yeah, they're out there. People are out there. They're preaching and they're trying to get my goat because they don't like me and they're expecting me to get upset. But I'm going to say, bless the Lord. Increase the work of their hands. Bring people to you. The kingdom is marching on. You see, to have the spirit mindset and to learn it is to learn that the kingdom is marching forward and we are called to be those who are learning to see it. So we're not judging everything that God's doing. He's spirit, right? So he's operating in this. Now he also does things in this. But we're so, we so often just look at what we can see to determine the nature of God. That's why all of our songs are, He is good, He is good, He is magnificent, He is holy, He is wonderful, He is all-powerful because He is. And He's using you. So whatever it is going on in your life, in your prayer time, take a step back and say, Jesus, show me. As bad as this is upsetting me and hurting me, show me. What are you doing in your spirit? Let me have a glimpse. And then give me a way to think. Let me think like Paul did. Let me learn these things. So I hope I gave you enough one, two, threes through there that you can take the passage and you can work with it and you can learn with it and you can move with it so that we know that no matter what's coming against us, there is a way to think in the spirit with it. And in that way, our hope and our joy is increased and the kingdom of God is increased. Because circumstances change. Have you noticed? They change. What is true today, give it two years. It may not be true at all in our world. We don't know. But with the Lord, it is always. Always. So, he has many things for us to do. But our purpose in loving him is to receive his point of view about our lives and about our loved ones. He loves them much more than we do. And if we can find it in our hearts to love them even though they're ornery, sometimes, then we've taken a big step in spirit. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for... <laughs> Would you let Paul know that we appreciate him putting, up, putting that down on paper for us? <laughs> and thank you for preserving it so we'd have ways to think and ways to move and ways to know in the spirit that we were moving in spirit. Lord, I bless you. We give you glory and honor. And as we fellowship, we thank you for Miss Dawn and Miss Umara. And we just thank you, Lord Jesus, for all they've done for tonight for our fellowship time. And Lord, as we worship together and, and we have worshiped together and as we pray together and minister together and share food together, fellowship, that we would be glorifying you and bringing you praise, reaching for the one spirit that we are with you and what you would say and how you would have us see it. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus. And everyone said, Amen, amen and Amen.